It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Hey, welcome back to Kubrick's Universe. I'm your host, Jason Furlong, and our man twiddling the knobs is Mr. Stephen Rigg. Today we have something quite special for you. A wonderful guy from Los Angeles who has been a film editor since the late 1970s. He was Oscar and BAFTA nominated for Best Film Editing for his seminal work on the fantastic Australian movie, Babe. He went on to work again with Mad Max director George Miller on Babe 2, Pig in the City. Jay tells us how he got into the business and one of his first experiences in the cutting room working with Robert Redford on Ordinary People, which went on to win four Oscars including Best Picture and Best Director for Redford himself. But it was his connection to The Shining that we really wanted to speak to Jay about. Jay has the distinction of being the guy who was woken early one morning in New York by a telephone call from Stanley Kubrick, who offered him a very interesting job proposition. See, The Shining had been in a handful of cinemas in New York and L.A. on its opening night when Stanley decided he hadn't finished editing the film. Jay was tasked with driving to each and every one of the cinemas in New York the next day to remove the now infamous hospital scene from the end of the final reel of The Shining. We spoke to Jay in May 2022. So now, from our vault of Can't Make This Stuff Up, we give you our interview with The Last Man to Edit The Shining. Jay, thanks so much for joining us on the show. How you doing, man? I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here. Cool, cool, man. Um, just to get started, can you tell us about yourself, um, how you gained an interest in film editing, and how you became a film editor? Okay. Um, well, I was kind of an industry brat. Um, my mom was a dancer on Broadway, and then... She, um, as she put it, she got dropped on her head a few too many times <laughs> during dance routines. And so she became an actress. You can make your own judgments about that. And uh, eventually she wound up um, being on the soap opera Love of Life for 20 years. Wow. And so that side is acting. My dad worked in publicity and promotion. And that's how he met her. Okay. Um, he was doing publicity on a show she was on. Then he eventually wound up working at the studios. He worked at Columbia. Then he worked at a pretty famous publicity outfit called, um, suddenly I can't remember. Oh, well, then he worked a strange name for a publicity. outfit. Yeah, I know. (laughs) It's particularly inappropriate for publicity outfit. If you think about it, but (laughs) then he worked at 20th century Fox. (laughs) <laughs> and then he worked at um, Warner Brothers and continued to work in the industry. So he got me my all important first job as a bike messenger um, for a trailer company in New York called Utopia Productions. And I did two summers there. I always say that the reason they liked me, because I was one of the few clients kids who didn't spend the summer on acid. <laughs> um, just half and, the summer. <laughs> well, but summer I was working for them. <laughs> and they, uh, and when they found out I was uh, taking leave from college, they asked me to stay. So I wound up just working my way into the trailer industry at that point, working okay. there and at a place called Canoe Manger. Then it was called Canoe Manger Deutsch. Then it was called the Canoe Company. I think you can see the idea. Then it was like, can you just stop changing your name? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'll let myself out. It's all right. And I mean, Canoe, if you've ever heard that name, possibly in association, say, with Revenge of the Nerds, that would be... Yeah, 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 okay. That would be um, the part of that connection. Anyway, um, so I edited trailers for 13 years, I think, something like that. And just when I was getting kind of tired of that, I got a... um, 
through my father, he was very close with George Miller, Mad Max George Miller. Yeah, of course. And George needed somebody to do the NBC censors cut of <laughs> Road Warrior. Right. You know, so taking out all the good bits. Basically. And so he asked me to do it. I was more than thrilled. <laughs> um, and then eventually he wound up deciding he wanted to do it in Australia. And I still stayed attached to doing it. So I went out to Australia, became friendly with that whole mob out there with George and his uh, producing partner, Doug Mitchell, and various other people there. And um, fell in love with it, which leads to the later part of what you plan on asking me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so then, um, yeah, uh, came back, uh, and I started working with a commercial and music video director at the beginning of his career, Marcus Nispel, who went on to do Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Fuck out of here. Wow. And I worked very closely with him for a long time. Um, and then, uh, you know, I actually, then through strange circumstances, but my association with Kennedy Miller, George Miller, I wound up cutting Babe, the sequel to Babe, a few other things. Um, now mostly I do kind of documentary style stuff and commercial stuff. I haven't done a feature since about two and a half years ago. I did a film called Violet that was Justine Bateman's directorial debut. Huh. I had become friendly with her by cutting a few shorts for her. And uh, for some reason, she liked me. Interesting. No wanting for taste. And, <laughs> Stop. Um, Stop. So that's kind of my thing. How did, like the, how did you enjoy that experience working with, the, with her uh, for her first time directing? She is one of the nicest, smartest, um, most thoughtful people that I've actually ever worked with mm. and it was an absolute freaking delight i, I can um, see it she exudes a certain uh ease within herself always has i felt although i don't follow her career closely i of course was like all 80s teen boys i was hopelessly crushed on her yes that's every single guy i meet if i finds out i'm working with justine they go oh i had such a can crush. you introduce me to her uh, they know better. Can you get me um, here? Anyway. Yeah, no, I'm following you. Right. Yeah. Do you need, do you so, need a replacement now? You need a moment with yourself? <laughs> if I need a replacement, I'll call Paul Westerberg. He still won't answer, though. Anyway. Um, anyway, so that's kind of <laughs> the broad thing. I, I've, I've had an incredibly lucky career, um, you know, where a lot of wonderful opportunities have dropped into my life, um, yeah. dropped into my lap. Although my wife will maintain it's because you're actually very talented and a very nice guy, but I feel just incredibly lucky at the stuff that's come my way. It's got to be a bit of both, right? You know, uh, uh, what is it? Edison said uh, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. You know, he left out anxiety. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> Forgot about <laughs> worry. Don't... There's no worry in that. Maybe he <laughs> blends that with perspiration. But he Probably. left out anxiety and worry. But Probably. maybe that's just maybe that's well, just the New Yorker in me. Well, I, I get that too. I get that too. But I mean, clearly, you can't be too hard on yourself in the sense that you've accomplished some really cool stuff. And I, I definitely want to, us to come back to Babe and Babe Pig in the City and your experience working with Frank Miller, um, as we are all huge fans of his work, obviously as well. But being that this is Kubrick's universe, we're gonna you know hyper jump to the question of the day how did you become involved with editing of the shining i'm sure this is a fascinating story so i'm just going to let you go okay um basically my dad worked for warner brothers um foreign advertising publicity he um was friends with a guy who worked in the london office named julian senior who uh, who was incredibly close with Kubrick. And I had always heard, but never had confirmed that whenever Kubrick was actually making a film, Julian wound up spending more time with Kubrick than at his Warner Brothers office because Kubrick 
though, you know, a brilliant filmmaker I heard could kind of occasionally be spaced out as a human being <laughs> so that they, you know, Julian was kind of there as his, his right-hand man, pal, confidant, uh, keeper of feet on the ground. Julian once told a great story about how he was at Kubrick's house and Kubrick had like a sausage in his pocket. And it's not a metaphor. Right. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and he says, Stanley, wh why do you have this sausage in your pocket? Why don't you put it in the refrigerator? And he goes, well, if I put it in there, somebody's going to eat it. So, <laughs> you know, so that Julian, sounds like him. Julian told me that story as a, a sense of like his kind of foot grounding influence mm -hmm. on Stanley. <laughs> so because of I, I had met Julian, um, when I did my inevitable backpacking in Europe sort of thing, you know, your parents give you any adult that they might know. So you just, you know, have somebody to contact if you're in trouble. Right. Um, I had met Julian and he knew I was an editor. Well, at that point I was a junior editor in New York city. It's the day after the shining is opened and I get a call Saturday morning. I remember frighteningly early for somebody who was, my age. What year did The Shining come out? 80. 1980. Okay, I was 23. Um, and, uh, you know, he says, listen, I'm sorry to wake you up this early in the morning, but um, <laughs> we have a little bit of a problem. And um, Stanley Kubrick's going to be calling you in half an hour. Jesus. And so being a crass New Yorker, I say, cut the shit, Julian. You don't need to make stuff up to, right. as an excuse for having woken me up at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning. He goes, no, 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 really, seriously. We have a little problem and we need you to do us a favor. So in a half an hour, Stanley Kubrick calls me up and <laughs> explains that he wants to take a scene out of The Shining, which is opened the night before at theaters, like I think it was six theaters in the New York area. Mm -hmm. And also in Los Angeles, but needless to say, that was out of my um, no. jurisdiction. <laughs> um, and very carefully, and for this was the thing that always freaked me out. This is the only reason it's worth talking to me, okay, <laughs> about this story. Um, for some reason, he spent quite a bit of time explaining to me as to why he wanted to take it out. Oh, interesting. And... So, I'm you know I'm sure anybody who's listening to your podcast or is is somewhat familiar with this infamous lost scene from the end of the film, right? And that basically, to you civilians who've seen the film, hmm. um, the film essentially goes the chase through the maze, right? Nicholson's character frozen in the snowbank music and a slow push into that photo of what was it? 1921. Yeah. So 21. Yeah. yeah. twenty one, The July 4th ball. Right. Right. Um, uh, July 4th. Yes. Okay. Whatever. I didn't pay attention to that part. And so the scene was in between those two moments. And, Got it. um, you know, you guys probably in the Kubrick universe, um, <laughs> I would say you're firmly placed in the Kubrick universe with this story, but go on. Okay. Well, we have a greater awareness of all this stuff that's been, um, you know, hypothesized about the content of the, the scene. I vaguely remember it. Um, so anyway, Stanley told me, he said, look, the reason I want to take it out is because I've been in screenings with the scene in and with the scene out. Mm. So with the scene in, the film ends, people are kind of respectfully quiet and they kind of just wander out of the theater. You know, with the scene in, some people applaud, they stay through the whole credits, the, the room feels energized. And, oh, um, wow. and that was his explanation of why he had sought you know, why he decided to do it. I mean, anything else I know about it, I've just heard probably from all the same kind of sources as you guys have heard as to what was in the scene. I do remember 
let's see, I'll back up a bit. So basically, at that point, I get hired by Stanley Kubrick to grab my splicer, my uh, my synchronizer, which is a piece of editing equipment, mm-hmm. and go around to all the theaters in Manhattan. There was one in Long Island, and there was one in New Jersey. Yeah, that's as near me. The one, Essex two, Green. Three, four. I feel like there must have been some more than that because I feel like I went to six theaters and that's only accounts for four. Anyway, and, you know, Warner Brothers hires me a limo. And you have to understand, I'm 23 years old. I have a ponytail halfway down my back, (laughs) a beard like some kind of, I don't know, old onion thing. And I'm and I'm running, you know, I'm walking in the theaters and in the beginning, it's before showtime, so it's easy. But then I start showing up at theaters, and the film's running. So each time I walk into a theater, I got to decide if I have enough time to work on the last reel of the film and oh, get it dear. back up with the projector. Right, right, right. Or if I have to sit there for however much time <laughs> to um, get it you know, done. So I did, I did see this... this seen a couple of times um and then uh uh yeah and it kind of went from the sublime to the ridiculous it was very easy in the beginning um because the theaters were closed then i and it was in the the period where i'm not sure if this is kind of minutiae that's ultimately boring because this is really just the physicalness of film at that point right you know theaters were going from single booth single projectionist right two right. projectors with the marks up in the corners to tell you change marks and they change the thing yep. to then putting it in bigger reels so that they could have multiple projection booths and multiplexes right to and i had never seen this before and i got to the theater it was the last one of the night where they literally spliced the entire film together in one giant massive roll probably about six feet wide of film that really flying through and gets pulled up on a spool on the top. So the um, projectionist wouldn't even have to change a reel. No, but this was also, you know, when multiplexes were starting to happen. So right. This was the right. Of being able to have one projectionist running six. Oh my God. Wow. Six screens. So, you know, the, I mean, basically I get to the theater once this, the film was, you know, was playing and I'd have to make this decision. I, I made it each time. Um, I would like to say it has to do with my skill, but it has probably more to do with my paranoia. Um, <laughs> Anxiety have, having a good place sometimes. Yes. So then I think the only two really interesting things after this, unless something I've said is triggers you in a good way. Um <laughs> The the two funniest things associated with this were on Sunday, I realized, you know, I haven't seen this film. I should probably call up one of the theaters and say, I have to go inspect the print to see how it's playing and get a free seat to watch. Right. The damn right. Movie. Sure. Sure. So I call up the theater. Um, um, I think it was the Sutton on 57th Street off of Lexington. And which was a high end theater, um, and asked to speak to the manager, and he goes, "Thank God you called." (laughs) And I'm saying, my mother doesn't even feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, that's a great joke. And I said, "Why?" He said, "Because I had somebody come up to me on Saturday." screaming at me Saturday night screaming at me how dare you change the work of a master the film's been changed since I saw it on Friday night Mm -hmm. and he's yelling in this the theater manager's face wow and the theater manager going what is he talking about and then somebody in the theater goes yeah some guy said he was from Warner Brothers came in with his splicer and started cutting the movie Mm -hmm. they hadn't been told and yet I had still got into the theater to change the film. Wow. So he was more than happy to see me. Right. Because it confirmed that it wasn't some nutcase 
I mean, you know, the prospects for some kind of strange short film about somebody who goes and changes movies on their own, going to cinemas, taking out the scenes they don't like, struck me very much at that point. But I'm too, I, I'm happy to have ideas and too lazy to execute. You could have done it back then. Today, it would be lost on the audience. Well, They'd have no idea that that was a thing. Yeah, exactly. So basically, and then the other cool part to go with this story and yes, everybody asked me the question you're about to ask me. Warner Brothers made sure that I gave them back every physical copy that I had. Right. Um, but you so ran off one print for yourself and you're going to share it with us exclusively. <laughs> you know, where I was working at the time, we actually had a flatbed system that had a camera on it. And I could have recorded it, but um, I for some reason, either didn't think of it or I did it and forgot about it and then lost the tape. Not to be dear, intriguing at all. Dear Lord, not at all intriguing. Um, <laughs> but Kubrick called me the next time day to ask me how it went. And we wound up chatting a whole bunch then. I can't even remember too much about it. Um, you know, one, I, should, I should put in one tiny little caveat here to explain why it was a, why Kubrick had to spend so much time with me to explain this. In those days, because of the way sound was physically on the film print. Right. And because film goes through frame by frame by frame in a stutter. Right. You know, shutter opens, it shows mm -hmm. you the frame for one twenty-fourth of a second. Shutter opens. You can't have the sound going like that. So the sound is a foot and a half ahead of the film so it's going through constantly and the picture is doing the shutter thing while the set i can't do this i got it no you're right i follow you <laughs> um so it meant that where you cut the physical film the picture doesn't reflect the sound that is at that point so stanley had worked out exactly the frame that i had to cut so the sound wouldn't bump but that the picture would be okay and blah 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 so that was kind of what led to the length of our conversation. And I, I remember saying to him, Stanley, I'm really sorry. At one of the theaters, I lost an extra frame. I felt, I felt horrible. <laughs> I, think I think it'll be all right. Wow. Um, so he was, was he wasn't like hey, you put it in your pocket. He didn't accuse you of taking one frame of his print. <laughs> I'm kidding. It actually, anyway. And yeah. the interesting thing was the following week, Kubrick called me again. I'm going, hey, we're buddies now. <laughs> and he said to me, I'm really worried about, I, I'm worried about the box office. <laughs> I'm the schmuck with the ponytail and the splicer. Why are you right. talking to me about box office? He goes, yeah, the two theaters in Manhattan, it's doing really well at one, and it's not doing anywhere near the same business at the other theater. And I'm, I'd really like you to go look at the prints. Hmm. And um, I said, well, I, I, you know, being a Manhattan person, I can tell you that the theater it's doing really well in is a high end artier house where people will go see will go see any Kubrick film the second it comes out versus the other cinema was the Olympia on 108th Street mm -hmm. where people will only go based on how good the advertising got them in and don't care one bit about a Kubrick film. Right. And he said, yeah, yeah, okay, but just go check. The <laughs> <laughs> of course, leaving, uh, out the, leaving out the logic that you don't see a bad print until after you paid. Anyway, and I went right. I, I, up to 108th Street, watched the film. I said, well, maybe it's a little bit, uh, a little bit soft. And then he railed against uh, the process of making IPs, which is the way from one master negative that has physic that is the negative that came out of the camera that had physical splices that they put together right the way they can run hundreds of prints and not damage that is they make a thing called an ip called an interpositive right and they print off of those so they'll maybe make say 20 of those and those ips are could make let's say a hundred prints each and thus right you have two thousand prints for the united states and I have to presume, by the way, through this whole process, that there was somebody in Los Angeles who did the same job as me. Although I was thinking about it before I came on today and suddenly realized, you know, Los Angeles 
probably was what where all the prints were made. So they probably just picked them up, took them to the lab, mm-hmm. gave them prints. Stands so think, to reason. I think somebody doesn't have the same dramatic story as I get to have. <laughs> um, and that's why they're not on this show. Or you haven't found <laughs> them because you're lazy. Bastard. <laughs> anyway, that's what I got. That's my Kubrick story. Oh, and the only thing I can say about it is what I do remember the scene being a shot where, is it Leslie Nielsen? Not Leslie Nielsen. Um, Barry. Barry Nelson. Barry Nelson. I was going to say, he wasn't an airplane. Barry Nelson was. <laughs> so Barry Nelson, who we'd only seen in one scene earlier in the film as like, I guess the manager of the, of the hotel yep. who hires Nicholson. Um, we see him walking into the hospital. We see him stop and talk to the son, um, Danny. Mm-hmm. So who's sitting, I think is sitting like on the, the counter at the nurse's station, you know, chatting with the nurses or something like that. And then he goes on to Shelley Duvall's room and um, she's in a hospital bed and she's doing her best Shelley Duvall bird thing, <laughs> you know, being like nervous and freaked out. And he essentially says to her, you know, he's, are you all right? Da, 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 da. I said, by the way, you know, we've looked around and there is no evidence of any of the things having happened that you said having happened. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to the slow push in on the photo from 1920, whatever it was. Right. So that much I remember, you know, I've heard subsequently that he hands Danny a um, ball, the tennis Danny ball, tennis ball, which I guess alludes to Nicholson's throwing the ball against the wall endlessly in that, you know, lunatic thing where you see. He's yeah. Lunatic. And da- Danny is uh, playing alone with his uh, matchbox cars in the hallway oh, and the, the tennis ball rolls up from an empty hallway. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. moment. Yes. Right. But did you do you not recall seeing that part of the cut scene? I don't remember the ball, the tennis ball. Okay. I, I just remember because I hadn't seen the film yet. So a guy handing a kid a tennis ball is not going to track right, with right, right, right. You know, uh, it, it's going to track that there's an older man, you know, saying something nice to a little boy and then going into a hospital room. And then, you know, the only other person I recognize being Shelly Duvall mm. uh, being there. So that's really all I remember, I don't remember the tennis ball, but you know, I, I gather it was in storyboards or some kind of. Right. There's, so there's some evidence for it. Want to not forget to ask, how did you go about delivering the excised scene back to the proper hands? Uh, I, I can't remember. I mean, you know, in those days, that was when I, I was working at a trailer company and the the skeleton Warner Brothers office in New York had a nightly pouch that went to Los Angeles. Okay. Um, literally, just you know, they called it the pouch. You know, it was a big mail bag that just went straight to the studio every night. Mm. And um, I think that's where I delivered it. Um, I'm not specific. I'm not sure, but I know that they were very diligent. You know, they made it very clear from the very beginning that they wanted those, those physical pieces of film. Right. And you would have had to label them as such before putting them in the pouch. I put them in a box. I think they knew what they were getting. I don't really know what I, if I would have labeled them or not. Um, Mm. You know, they wouldn't have had. I, I only ask because it's, you know, assumable to use a word that doesn't exist. Like, you know, uh, somebody on Kubrick's end would have been meticulous enough to insist on stuff like that. I guess. Um, I mean, they probably would have been labeled in terms of the box I put them in. I can't imagine that I labeled the individual pieces of film in case, you know, somebody's trying to look through an archive and says, ooh, here's a 90-second piece of (laughs) film from the 70s, 80s. Uh, I wonder what this might be. Um. (laughs) find a working moviola, put it up on that. Um, so yeah, that's what I got. That's what I got on that story. That's 
that what you got is a lot and it's really effing cool um, okay i'm going to tell you one anecdote please the end of the night my limo <laughs> pulls <laughs> up to a sixplex in jersey i think mm-hmm. it was a multiplex i think it might have been it doesn't matter by then it's saturday night movie night right Right. There were lines all over the place. I, I don't know if any of them were for specifically for The Shining. But as my limo pulls up, the manager comes out. And I, you know, in the old days, managers would sometimes have like those cummerbunds and like yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. box things, right? Absolutely. So he comes up to my limo and he's like, oh, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you. And I'm kind of walking in the theater. You know, he's showing me and I got my box full of shit. And I hear somebody in line go, who's that? <laughs> I heard somebody go, I think it's Peter Frampton. <laughs> Show up, Peter Frampton showing up in his limo yeah, with his splicer, with his splicer, <laughs> his little known sideline, right? Of, uh, to chop two you- films once they're on the screen. No, he was with the splicer to cut. You know, do you feel like we do down from twenty minutes to a radio friendly edit? Yeah, exactly. At the multiplex, so. <laughs> As one does. Sure. When you're Peter Frampton, you know, with a side gig of editing, you know, Stanley Kubrick films. So I'm going to ask, do you recall if the theater, the one in Jersey was uh, the Essex Green Cinema? Does that ring a bell? No, sorry. You know, it's like at that point, it had been something like a 12 hour day. I was in the Mm -hmm. back of the limo you know, going out to Jersey for the last stop of the day and, and starting to get tired of the whole process. Mm-hmm. So I don't have a chance in hell of remembering that. I'm sorry. But, you know, you could probably look that up in the local papers to see who's advertising playing The Shining because it would have only sure. been one theater. Sure. And I'm old enough to know how to use a microfilm machine at my local library, if only they still had one. Uh, but microfiche. There's microfilm and microfiche. My dad actually worked for 3M in the 70s, and he was all over that. But I digress. The uh, reason I ask is because, Stephen, I need you to chime in here. I yes. believe in the Appreciation Society a while back, there was a, a member who had stated emphatically they did see it with the original uh, cut at the Essex Green Cinema, and I could be wrong, but they went back to see it, and they noticed the scene was missing, and it was probably over the same opening weekend time period. Um, But I remember that post, because the Essex Green is about 10 minutes from here. It's it's in West Orange, Jay, which borders Montclair, and is also uh, equidistant to Manhattan. And there was a chap in the group uh, a few days ago um, called Lawrence French, I think it was something to do with um, uh, one of the um, sci-fi magazines in the seventies. It did a lot of interviews. Um, Cinema Fantastique. Cinema Fantastique. Yeah, I think yeah. he's. I think he's the right for that. And he saw it on the Friday and the Saturday and noticed a difference. And wow. I'm trying to. I'm trying to have a chat with him to see um, what his take on it was. Mm. Uh, now, regarding finding the d- original dates, I have got access to the um, newspaper.com website, so I could probably go to the 20th, I think it was 23rd of May when it first screened right. uh, in America, and uh, I think its main release was uh, in June. So I think if I looked at the newspapers uh, on the 23rd of May, I could probably find exactly which uh, screens were showing it. Yeah, good yeah. idea. I, I'll yeah. look into that. Yeah, Check that out. And then we can get back to Jay with our findings and bore him further with this minutia. <laughs> we love it, though. We love the minutia. And anything we can hear and uh, connected with Kubrick, we, we love it. But in some, absolutely. And in some cases, it is more fascinating than others. And in such cases as this, obviously, we have to talk to the rare Jay that's out there in the world and get into this minutia because, you know, it's it's not too geeked out far down the Kubrick rabbit hole to want to know more about this. Um, a fellow named Steven Johnson, who used to run a blog on Bloomhouse um, when they had a blog part of their site mm. had um, tracked me down. And it was funny because I, I only told this story to friends and whatever poor bastard would listen. Um, usually assistant editors who get to hear old, old editor stories but um 
for some reason, somebody sent me a blog entry on it where people were talking about the idea that there was a missing scene. And I decided for, I don't know why, to just chime in and say, there definitely was, I know, because I'm the guy who pulled it out of the prints on the East Coast. Steven Johnson tracked me down at that point. So he interviewed me once and had it published um, on his blog on Bloomhouse. And then because of that, and that's no longer up anymore. I think um, they're not hosting that site anymore. Hmm. And then because of that, um, I am suddenly spacing. There, There is a, a one of the big players over at Pixar. Um, Lee Unkrich. Lee Unkrich must have seen Steven's blog. And he, I think, is working on a book or was planning on working on a book about yeah. Kubrick, if not specifically The Shining. It is, so specifically. He, he spoke to me about it. And it's interesting because I believe that he actually interviewed this fellow in London that I mentioned at the beginning named um, Julian Senior. I believe that he interviewed him um, about the circumstances as well. And he was kind enough to let me hear the interview at one point. Oh, cool. Um, we always used to shoot, to tease Julian that if he ever had a son and named it Julian, then his kid would be Julian Sr. Jr. <laughs> anyway, and would never get to school with his lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jersey joke. Oh, yep. That is a Jersey joke. <laughs> um, so those are the two times. Uh, and I think Lee just used it as research. He never published it anywhere. And Stephen just, you know, like I said, he 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 did it as part of his blog, which is no longer up. Sure. Um, so those are the two times I have I've somebody's bothered to ask that wanted to actually write it down or record it in some way. Yeah, and you said Lee was uh, Lee interviewed you uh, you about. Uh, this scene for the book. Yeah. Lee Unkrich. Yeah. Yes. The fact that he runs this website called the overlook.com. I don't know if you're familiar, but he's like one of the biggest shining geeks in the world. There is some crazy stuff on that site. Yeah, man, there is. It's ain't there? Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry. You just made me think of something. Oh, listen, now that I have you guys on the zoom, let it. me ask you a Cooper question. Ooh. I had heard recently that he did something very, very similar with 2001, where he went back and changed it a bit after its initial release. Do you guys know if that's true? Steven? Well, you go uh, first. It wasn't, it wasn't quite after the uh, um, release. It was just before. It was kind of at the, at the studio screenings. Uh, and he took out about, was it 24 minutes, I Jason? I think that's right. I think that's right. So the famous 24-minute scene uh, of the astro- of the astronauts just wandering around and uh, going around the wheel and things like that. And uh, they basically put the scissors in either side and took a 24 minutes out and shortened, and shortened the film somewhat. Well, I think that was the, just before it went on general release. So that was in response, because I guess what I heard was it was in response to screenings then. So it was kind of a similar thing where he saw that people were not responding well to something. Or yeah. That it wasn't working in terms of the overall arc of the film. Yeah. Um, okay. Because I just heard that literally yesterday when somebody told me, when I was oh, wow. telling somebody about doing this with you guys, and they said, well, didn't he do the same thing with 2001? Yeah, he did. I think he just took out an entire reel. Um, Some filmmakers, you really just have to like give knockout drops to get the film in the lab, get it out in the theater before they wake up, you know, because they're going to keep mucking about with it. Yeah. Tell that to George Lucas. Well, he was actually editing. uh, Kubrick was editing the 2001 Space Odyssey on the ocean liner on That's the boat correct. Yeah. From, Engl- from England to New York. <laughs> yeah. He was still editing it. He, got, he had his editing equipment on the boat. Like, that's insane, but brilliant. <laughs> well, like, you know, he didn't he, he notoriously didn't like flying. Wasn't he also one of those guys? Yeah. yeah. 
And he had obtained a pilot's license as a young man, believe it or not. It's like, you can't make this stuff, this stuff up. Yeah. He, well, this- I will say it was interesting because when he was meticulously describing to me, like what frames to cut on and then giving me like, you know, it's footage. So it's very easy to tell, you know, where exactly to cut. But he decided to describe describe what was in each frame to me oh, wow. to a certain extent, just to make sure I wasn't in the wrong place. And I, you know, afterwards I was thinking that was kind of a little <clears throat> crazy. Um, and then somebody <laughs> reminded me that this was a guy who had been like a world class chess player when he was in his teens. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, yeah it mm-hmm. is. So yeah. That his 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 attention to detail, which I guess we then see in the you know, famous stories of 127 takes of Scatman Crothers crossing right. the street or something like that. Right, right. We, we, we see it in that as well. So I guess I was spared any, you know, real overwhelming repercussion of that. Yeah, but I mean, you were the beneficiary, uh, you know, not having to be part of those 127 take type, uh, you know, personality quirks because as i mean to paraphrase as i understand he viewed chess as a great way to develop strategic thinking to be four moves ahead that kind of thing which mm-hmm. i imagine is extremely beneficial when you're not just a filmmaker but you know controlling a, a set as large as 2001 a production team etc as large as that um but yeah i mean i i think what you heard is fairly accurate steven can know better than i but it was like early test screenings and he was responsive to that kind of stuff. He was, you know, meticulous in his own mind about his, his vision, but then he was malleable about uh, what's working and what's not in accordance with what, you know, read the room type of uh, experience showed him. Um, So it's, it's interesting. There's a connection there between 2001 and then, you know, 12 years later, you, uh, doing the same service for him. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, having been in a fair number of cutting rooms myself, you know, you, you, you have filmmakers who make films for people. So they're going to respond to people like maybe less movie executives than when they see an audience and the audience responds and they go, Oh, that's not working. I'm going to jump ahead, obviously thanking you for all of this insight, but I'm going to jump ahead to a question we touched upon before we began the interview proper and say thank you for your work on Babe and Babe Pig in the City, because we have to touch briefly upon your experience working with Frank Miller and on those two films, because they're just magical. I'll give you the quick, dumb story. I was living in Boston. I had seen the trailer for Babe on uh, tv i said that's got to be charming i didn't get to the theater fast forward uh when i saw the vhs at tower records uh on mass ave and sight unseen i bought it and promptly fell in love with it and i remember it was one of the last vhs tapes i bought before i got my first dvd player and i wore that tape to death of course when the sequel came out i I saw it on the big screen and it's it's just such a wonderful Like, I don't have enough uh, ebullient adjectives for how much I love those films, especially the original. When I first came to the boss's farm, it was a whole new world to me. Everyone here seemed to know their place. The boss and his wife, the sheepdogs, the sheep, and all the other animals. Well, almost. We've got to do something about that duck. Now I just have to figure out where I fit in. <laughs> I want my mom. Good heavens. Who are you? Bank. <laughs> there, there. The little pig's a bit low. He's going to sleep with us. But mom, you went to bed. <sighs> what are you? You pig. What are you? I'm a you. A you. This is the story of a brave soul. Hello, sir. Get out of here. Whoa, whoa. Who was trying to find his destiny. Can I learn how to work the sheep today? Get him up, pig. Remember, you have to dominate them. Bend them to your will. Ruff, 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 ruff. He knew his path would not be easy. <laughs> I'm not sure if you realize how much the other animals are laughing at you. It's not a duck that thinks it's a rooster. It's a pig that thinks it's a dog. <laughs> you should accept what he is and be thankful for it. But now he's determined. 
They're sheep. They're inferior. Oh, no, they're not. To take care of business. All a nice little pig like you need do is ask. His way. Thanks very much. It was very kind of you. A pleasure. What a nice little pig. From Universal Pictures comes the story of Babe. You look like an intelligent, sophisticated, discerning young fella. Who, me? The pig with the gift of gab. La, la, la. Nerves of steel. <laughs> Yeah, big buttheads. And a heart. May I call you mom? Of gold. <laughs> Babe. He saw me standing alone. Without a dream in my heart. Without a love of my heart. Without a love of my heart. Tell us a little bit about, or tell us a lot about how you got involved and what your experience was. Well, I wound up on the first film by mistake. So, um, like I was saying to you earlier, I have had extraordinary things fall into my lap, and I feel blessed by that. Um, basically, I was friendly with a lot of the folks at Kennedy Miller, the company that made Babe. Mm -hmm. um, I'd known George Miller for a couple of years through my father, um, a friend, and I was down on holiday um, in Sydney. And uh, went down to set where they were shooting. Um, they were like two weeks into production, I think. And a guy I had become very, very close friends with, um, he's one of my closest friends, Marcus Darcy, was cutting the film. And I think it was his first solo time in the chair. And it was also in the very early days of using avid media composer mm -hmm. to cut feature films. Yeah. Um, he'd worked in film, you know, physical film. He'd done that before, but he, you know, basically they decided to cut it on avid and I went down to set and I went to visit him in the cutting room because what else do you want to do on your holiday, but go <laughs> sitting in an editing room <laughs> if you're an editor. And, um, I, and he was, uh, and I'd been working on it since close to the beginning of its use in New York a few years earlier. And so I was pretty conversant with it. And I saw him working. He was largely working only with a mouse. And I, I was realizing that I need to help out my friend here and show him how to, you know, show, give him some help learning how to use the machine. Right. And so we would sit down. We'd cut some scenes together and then kind of because I knew the folks from Kennedy Miller, you know, they'd come in and I'd be sitting at the, the, at the avid cutting and, you know, and I spent a, a few days down there. I think I might've cut one scene just for fun. Mm -hmm. And because they were rushing to get stuff to CGI to generate, to really start working on the animal talking uh, CG. Right. And, Which was crucial. Right. right. And, you know, they, George always maintains that he actually had this film in his head for a number of years, but was waiting for the technology to catch up so that he could do it. Right. Anyway, so I went back to the States, get a call a few weeks later. And, um, and they say, you know, we're realizing that it might be good to have two editors on the film. Um, because it's not going to be an easy film to go back for reshoots with because they were literally breeding babes, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the, right, right. They needed females. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't see their testicles. from mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they could only use them for about three weeks before they would grow too quickly. Right. Cause you know, cause baby pigs grow very, very fast. Right. So, the prospect of going back for any kind of reshoot was ridiculous. So they really wanted to cut as, as, as deep as they could while shooting. So I said, look, I've got a month. I can come down, went down for a month, cut then went back to New York to do a job. And then they called me up and said, we really would like to have you come back down and at least get us, you know, the two of you working through, you know, the first presentation at studio. So I went down you know, and God bless him, my friend Marcus Darcy, who was the lead editor on it. You know, he, like I said, he's one of my closest friends, is also one of the nicest, most talented people that I know. 
And, you know, there was no jealousy involved. He was just happy for us to be working together mm. and, um, you know, helping each other out. And, you know, it was just quite something. And I was going to go down just until we got the cut to the studio and I wound up staying through finish and a little bit longer than that. Mm. Um, because Sydney is heaven. Yeah. And um, so that was, you know, <clears throat> the experience on the film. And we were... And at the time we had only one Avid. So we would work 12 hour shifts where at two o'clock in the afternoon, um, he would give me the Avid and I would work till two in the morning and he'd come in and work from two in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. He wanted to be home so he could pick up his kid at school and give him dinner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and it was an incredible experience working on that. You know, we are all learning as we we're going about a lot of stuff. And pioneering, if I may. You know, the interesting thing about that film is one of the things, I mean, Marcus did, Marcus shaped that film. Um, I, I walked into a piece that was in, um, for many other filmmakers, would have been fine to show. Mm. Um, and I helped, I think, pull together largely I, this is going to sound so weird, the animal performance. Because hmm. one of the things we learned early on with the CG was that you could not, we had a couple of rules that wound up developing over time is you couldn't violate any of the animals physical structure right. in making right. it talk. Right. So if a duck talked, it's beaks had to stay solid. Right. You couldn't suddenly have, you know, all right. this stuff you sometimes see in those kind of films, you go, okay, that's just weird. Mm -hmm. That looks like Lancelot chimp. Mm -hmm. If you guys even know what right. that is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the other thing we realized was that you had, we had to support it as much with body movement as we could. Mm. So if you look, there's almost always some kind of emphasis with the right. body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Into what it's doing clearly because that, sold it rather than just like you know a, a pig there with its mouth moving like this right right and um i i think that i helped set up some of the the ways we went about choosing and picking that and we had all kinds of constraints because at the time we weren't a hit movie so we had a very very small uh special effects budget and these complicated formulas about how many shots we could do and what constituted an extra shot and all this kind of thing. Um, but anyway, I mean, it was, it was, it was great. We had, um, you know, Marcus and I worked really well together. Chris Noonan, the director is an absolute sweet, nice, delightful gentleman. Mm -hmm. I wish he made more films. You know, George is a freaking genius. Yeah, he is. And um, I mean, a monster in terms of like what goes on in his brain yeah yeah is is just and it's it sometimes working with george you just feel like you're a hack and you might as well just leave <laughs> you know uh, or you just like you know you just say i will use what little superpowers i have to fulfill his vision as much as right can. right robin to his batman more like uh, <laughs> the chambermaid in Wayne Manor to his back. <laughs> You're not doing yourself uh, enough justice, man, because the, the editing in that, <laughs> in both those films, but especially in Babe, like just in terms of the impact it had, it, it was it, it was like a, a big gasp, I think, for a lot of people. Um, it, it, you, you should give yourself some credit because that stuff was remarkable then. And even if you know, the younger audiences today have no idea how groundbreaking that stuff was. It was. And you were obviously crucial to, to seeing that happen. I think it'd be interesting to know whether or not Kubrick ever saw a screener and what he would have thought, because he was trying to develop AI and he had to put the project on hold or give it to Spielberg because he felt the technology wasn't there. And then along come you guys and you're doing this stuff with, you know, articulated speech that's realistic looking um, from animal mouths. And uh, there, there were, there were about four films I saw in a few years period. The first being the abyss and when Cameron had the, 
the pseudopod, the, the water weenie, they called it. I was in the theater for that. And you'll see in the commentary where they describe the, the collective gasp that the theater let out. I witnessed that myself. And then, of course, Terminator 2, but that was big blockbuster stuff. But then a few years later, you had Babe and you had uh, The City of Lost Children by Jeunet and Caro. And when the circus fleet jumps into the dog hair was just like, what is happening in cinema right now? And for someone born in 1970, it was like, if you had showed us this when we were children, you would never be, you would never believe it was possible. Um, and you guys were definitely at the vanguard of, of making that happen. And now of course it's de rigueur. Uh, but at one time it wasn't. And the, the reason it went from being, wasn't to being so is you know because of the imagination of persons like yourself few and far between the, they may be so like give yourself a little credit man well, well and of course uh babe was and you were not and you Jay, were nominated for exactly an, an oscar and a bafta tell us about that precisely well you know obviously you know it's the first feature film i've worked on and to get nominated was kind of just you know, stupid time. <laughs> um, I was, it, I, strangely enough, I was down in Australia. I can't remember why I was there when the nomination happened. So it meant that I actually got to, we all got to celebrate together because quite a few of us were nominated. I mean, there were seven nominations on that film, mm. if I remember correctly. Um, you know, the one great tragedy being that our DP didn't get nominated because that film was so free. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Ridiculous. Beautifully. He got nominated years later for the Lord of the Rings films, deservedly, but he should have been nominated for Babe. And, um, um, you know, and, and the thing when you get nominated in the Academy is particularly for categories like editing, you are nominated by editors. And I think that, you know, editors look at that film and go, God, that must have been a pain. In the ass. Right, 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 right. But okay. that's why they doff their cap to you. Well, I'll tell you the first when I was vi when I was visiting set the first day I'm on set. They were shooting before I'm working on the film. You know, I'm just visiting my friends, making a movie with pigs and goats and stuff that a New York City guy has no relationship with other than eating. <laughs> and um, and it's the scene where Babe goes up the hill, wakes up in the morning before everybody else goes up the hillside and then discovers that the rustlers are raiding the sheep. It's a beautiful little shot of him walking up a little path up this thing. And, you know, in the film, it's quite naive. You don't know what's coming. Da, da, da. And, you know, to be on set and to see what's actually happening off camera in order to get that pig mm. to go up <laughs> and stay on the path right. is, is quite a, conun you know, quite a different thing than what's actually on camera because they would use these, large garden rakes not to hit the pig but to tell them to kind of steer them right you know, if they right. saw the rake to one side they knew that they weren't going that way mm -hmm. and you have everybody yelling whatever the trainers are yelling and you've got six people three on either side screaming big 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 and then you see it in the film it's little cute pig butt waddling up the hill right Kind of thing, and um, it's very funny to to kind of recognize those moments, you know, that are that are just show up beautifully. Where you know all of this sentience are put in these animals, or a certain right. level of sentience right. Right. put in the animals. When you had seen what was actually taking, what it was taking to, you know, get the pig to go up the hill, and you're on set thinking, all right, I'm going to have to edit this, but I'm sure you must have had some faith in your ability, like within the shot that you were seeing, like. Well, I mean, specifically that story, I wasn't editing the film yet. I was visiting friends on holiday. Oh, so okay. okay. I wasn't thinking it wasn't my problem yet. <laughs> right. Right. So you're like, Oh, this is cool. I'm on a movie set. Yeah. It's kind of nice. It's pretty here. Look at all these things. <laughs> Um, hey, that animal trainer is kind of nice looking, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I'll give you another story if I'm not running on the mouth too much. No, 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 please. Um, you know, and this was actually one of my great, 
This is a classic Jay Friedkin moment where I went to the barriers for something. Anyway, the one of the other very famous scenes in the film is when Babe starts kind of singing Jingle Bells. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's gone off. Um, Farmer Hoggett's gone off, closed the gate. You know, you said, you stay here. And Babe kind of just starts singing Jingle Bells for no particular reason. And um, and then I think the film, I, the it irises yeah, out. Yeah, right, right. So that scene was a mistake. It was never planned. The pigs would do this thing where they would have markers hidden in the mud and they were trained to go walk up to the markers, put their front feet on it, and stay. Okay. That was what they were doing. But sometimes these guys, the pigs, would you know go, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Where the hell is my treat now? Where is my reward? Right, and right. they would start going like this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so we had this one Shaking shot. their heads around. Yeah. And screaming. Right. Um, and... Uh, and George is watching this film, this shot, and he's going, he says, make it a little longer, make it a little, you know, because we were trying to get out before all that was happening, make it a little longer. And he goes, you know, we could put something in here. And he's going with his voice, <laughs> not Babe's voice, going, I'm so happy I could sing. La, 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 la. That's what we had. Right. And I'm kind of going, oh, this is horrible. This is horrible. But, you know, the thing with working with George is you, you'll sometimes it's not that you learn to live with stuff. It's like you realize that he's got an idea. And if you just stay with him and do whatever you can to make sure he gets it expressed, you suddenly go, that's something I never would have thought of. Right. 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 But this one thing. Every time I saw it, it just made all of my orifices close for a while. <laughs> um, and we were on the verge of locking the picture. And I, I say to Bill Miller, George's brother, who was a producer on the film, Marcus Darcy, my co-editor. I say, okay, guys, we all agree that this is crazy, right? And they go, yeah, we agree this is crazy. Okay, well, this is the time we have to tell George that it's crazy. And they go, yeah, we'll tell George is crazy. We'll tell George is crazy. So we're screening that reel of the film and we get to the end of the reel and I'm getting ready to, to say it to George. And I look around and everybody's left. <laughs> so they left me there alone to say, except Marcus is there. I say, and I say, George, I've lived with this now for months and I think this is crazy. And George turns to Marcus and he goes, well, what do you think? And Marcus goes, I think it works. So he sells me out, but <laughs> God bless her. Chrissy. I can't remember what her last name was. Who did the voice of babe? Oh uh, yes. I'm sorry. I should, should know this. I had a crush on her too Christine, back in uh, Valley girl days. Anyway, uh, I can't remember, but she, she nails it. She just nails it. First of all, they lose the I'm so happy I could sing part, which is what was killing me. So it wasn't a CG shot. It was a live pig shot, what we call the peanut butter shot, because that meant that we would just somehow match into what was going on live with the animal's lips. And that's a reference to how they used to do Mr. Ed. Right, of course. Um, where they would put give him peanut butter in his mouth and he trying to get rid of it, <laughs> he would move his lips and then they would sink whatever Mr. Yeah. Ed was saying. Hello, I'm Mr. Ed. Steven, do you have any concept of what Mr. Ed is? Yes, absolutely. Oh, I, I remember seeing Mr. Ed on reruns, of course. Uh, and Jason's trying to find uh, Christine Kavanagh. Thank you. Yes. yes. Yep. Um, who didn't wind up doing the second film, but was completely, um, what's it called? Fake bond, fake whatever. <laughs> by uh, her, her colleague on Rugrats who did the second Babe. Anyway, so that's my other amusing, specifically amusing story for Babe. Um, it was an incredible experience. He and what did. was nice about it was yeah. there was no pressure on that film from the studios. You know, they didn't know what they had. Right. And, uh, so, you know, Stephen, by the way, is very up on American TV. You'd be surprised. 
He, he <laughs> no, for for real though. I mean, you want to talk Blues Brothers for two hours, like American, American film, films, not American well. TV. No, no, but you you know more about American TV than any other. Really? I, oh okay. my gosh! Yeah, absolutely. Um. So so what happened at the at the Oscars? Have you got any memories of that night? I know that Chris Noonan stole my Oscar T-shirt. <laughs> um, no, he borrowed it for a photo shoot, and I never got it back. Um, but that's all right. He deserved two. <laughs> um, it was interesting um, because for a number of reasons, um, you realize that most people don't care. <laughs> 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 so if you get up. Uh, <laughs> Um, we, and what was cool for Marcus was that a guy that he had been the assistant editor for was up for seven. Oh, right. The films we right. Up against that year was Crimson Tide, which was Chris Levin's on. Um, we were up against Apollo 13, which was Mike Campbell. And I can't remember the second guy, but they're like Ron Howard's dudes. Mm -hmm. Um, Richard Francis. Bruce for seven, who Marcus, my co-editor, had worked with him before as an assistant. So that was kind of cool for him. Um, third film, Crimson Tide, uh, Braveheart? I'm not sure. I can't was... remember the fifth film. I think it might have been Braveheart. After a movie is shot, thousands of feet of film find their way into the hands of an editor. And then it begins, the delicate orchestration, as all the elements of a movie are masterfully cut together. This year, the nominees for film editing are... <laughs> Mike Hill and Dan Hanley for Apollo 13. Marcus Darcy and Jay Friedkin for Babe. Stephen Rosenblum for Braveheart. Chris Levinson for Crimson Tide. And Richard Francis Bruce for seven. And the Oscar goes to... Mike Hill and Dan Hanley for Apollo 13. Anyway, it doesn't matter, we lost. We lost to Apollo 13. Um, and so, you know, you go to the Oscars, it's a, you're walking in, we're kind of late, and we're seeing all these people lined up, nicely dressed. And we didn't know about the seat fillers when we walked in, the famous mm -hmm, seat fillers, mm -hmm. where if anybody who's watching this or listening to it don't know, that's when people get up and go to get a drink, go to the bathroom, all that sort of stuff. The last seconds before broadcast happens again, they fill those seats. So it always looks like the entire thing is full. Right, right. And... um so we learned about that that evening. We also learned that for certain awards, they just point rather than show all the nominees in the audience, they just they sit you all together and then they point the camera at the end of the aisle and figure whoever comes out must be the person that won the award because they're getting up to come get the award. How ceremonious. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I will say, as you may or may not know, this year they decided to pre-tape certain categories and editing mm -hmm. was one of them and it was kind of heinous mm -hmm. um the other thing i remember was getting a letter from quincy jones who was producing oh. the oscars that year with sort of like guidelines about how you might make your speech you now if i say it that way it's going to sound shitty he's basically sub saying something like you know this is your moment you deserve it it's wonderful but you know you have a choice between making a speech that would inspire people or a laundry list of people. Mm. So um, I'm putting it poorly because I'm no, making no. it a little bit cruder than it no, is. No, it's understandable. Um, actually, I'll be honest with you. The thing, you know, being nominated was amazing. Um, although to a certain extent, I feel like the guy, the high school f star football player <laughs> who still lives in his hometown of say Montclair, New Jersey, perhaps. <laughs> You know, still lives there. I was not the star football player. Is still in, the, you know, goes to the bar and people keep talking about that touchdown pass that he made, <laughs> you know, 10, 20, 
30 years ago. Right, right. I will say one of the coolest things was, um, you know, one night we were working, it was like the middle of the night and Marcus and I were there and, you know, we were exhausted. Um, and he just said probably one of the nicest things anybody's ever said to me. And this tells you how nice a guy he is and how close we are. He goes, you know, one of the things that's going to make this all worthwhile is at the end of the day, your name and my name are going to be up there on the screen together. Right. That's awesome. By the way, that was going to be my Oscar speech was telling people that he had said that. And uh, it was, that was the most important part of that speech to me, if I had been able to make it and BAFTA just to fill, finish it out. We didn't go to BAFTA. I mean, it, it was incredible to be nominated, but that was too much of a, of a thing for us. You know, the Academy Awards flew us from, from Australia Right. But I don't believe BAFTA was offering to fly us to London. So mm. <clears throat> didn't go. For any of us, it's obviously just something we can only imagine being over the moon to even be nominated and deservedly so. I mean, editing is something Stephen and I, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners always, you know, look at when we're appreciating film, not just Kubrick's work, but in general and, the fact that um, y- you have such a a unique story behind how you came to it, the 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 I'm not putting this well, but the the perspective, for lack of a better word, and the humanness of you, I've enjoyed the hell out of this. I know Stephen has. I'm pretty sure our listeners will too. Um, well, and I love listening to myself, so I've had a great time. That makes one <laughs> of us. <laughs> <laughs> Could, could I quickly um, bring up the fact that you was uh, an, an apprentice editor on Ordinary People, just before your involvement with Kubrick, I, I guess. In this typical town, in this comfortable home, three ordinary people are about to live an extraordinary story. It's starting all over again. The lying, the covering up, the disappearing for hours. I will not stand for it. I can't stand it. I really can't. Kind of psychiatrists are you? They all believe in dreams. I do believe in dreams. Only sometimes I want to know what's happening when you're awake. I don't want to see any doctors or counselors. This is my family. But if we have problems, then we'll solve those problems in the privacy of our own home. I knew something was wrong even before he tried to uh, kill himself. I think it is a very private matter. You never came to the hospital. Now, how do you know about the your hospital? Your did come to the hospital, comrade, and you know that. I just don't know how to deal with it anymore. Why are you hassling me? Huh? Why are you trying to make me mad? Why are you mad? No! He provokes people. I would never have let him put electricity in my head. Ah! You blame me for the whole thing. <laughs> Can't you see anything except in terms of how it affects you? I, I miss it sometimes. The hospital. But that was a hospital. This is the real world. Did it hurt? I've never really talked about it. How long are you going to punish yourself? When are you going to quit? You loved him. What in hell has happened? That she hates me. Can't you see that? Mothers don't hate their sons. I mean, there's someone besides your mother you gotta forget. You better make sure that your kids are good and safe. Ah! And then you come to me and tell me how to be happy. Do you love me? Do you really love me? Ah! Just do one wrong thing. And what was the one wrong thing you did? Donald Sutherland, Mary Tyler Moore, John Hirsch. Timothy Hutton, in an extraordinary story of ordinary people. Uh, And that one, best picture. Did you um, did you meet Redford on that on the on the edit? Oh, daily. Yeah, we cut that in. That was being edited by. My former boss at the time, Jeff Canoe of, and I, I know he hates this, so I love doing it, of Revenge of the Nerds fame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He also made some other great movies, Tough Guys with Burt Lancaster. Oh, I loved that movie when I was a kid. Movie. Yeah, great movie. Should have been a bigger hit, um, but got knocked out of the box office by Crocodile Dundee. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Yep. Damn Australians again. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, Jeff had worked cutting trailers for Redford for many years. And they were very close. And Redford insisted on Jeff cutting the film, which Jeff was always 
surprised by because he had guys, Redford had guys like Sam Osteen, like these top editors lining right, up to right. do it. And Redford wanted Jeff to do it. I don't, you know, who knows? Maybe he owed him money. I don't know. Hmm. But, um, and so we, I didn't start on that film on location, but the apprentice editor dropped off the film. And so when they came back to New York City, he brought me in. So I'm an apprentice. You're just sorting trims and stuff, but I'm there every day. Redford's there every day while we're cutting. We actually did it in an apartment rather than an editing facility, because in those days, if Redford would show up somewhere, there was too much of a kerfluffle. Mm -hmm. You know, it just was too distracting. So we rented an apartment, set up all these, you know, and that's, it was film. So it's this physicalness of film all over the fucking right. place. Right. Um, and Redford was, I got to say, incredibly nice. One of the smartest guys I've met. Mm. And one of the reasons, and, but smart in a really kind of special way where I think that he was really very aware of what his, where his um, holes were mm. and hired people to make sure that those gaps were filled, mm. you know, but he was, he was so nice to me and I'm just the schmuck sorting film trims. Mm. And, um, and it, it was really interesting. There was one day, the way our cutting room was set up that the place that we could screen it was the breakfast nook. Um, and that opened into this little New York city, tiny kitchen. So sometimes when Jeff and Redford were screening the film, I would be sitting back there watching. And there was one day, there was this scene that would always make me cry. <laughs> and Redford turns around and he sees me sobbing and he goes, well, I guess this scene works. <laughs> That's a cool story. Brilliant. <laughs> That's a cool story, man. Um, yeah. That was, that was very nice. But he, he was very classy guy. That was when he was around the time he was setting up Sundance. Mm-hmm. Um, when Sundance was just the the institute, you know, uh, that academy that or whatever it was called that was basically set up to pair experienced filmmakers with starting out filmmakers. Right. You know, it was before the film festival, before all of that mm -hmm. stuff. When mm -hmm. It was just really an exciting thing, an exciting time. Uh, so it was kind of cool to be around. Plus, I'd be answering the phone. I, Hi, this is Jane Fonda on the phone. Uh, is Bob there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. No, he's not here right now. But if you'd like, I'll take your number and I'll give yeah. it to him. Gets here. <laughs> um, if your voice was still breaking at that age, though, I gotta say there's a little something off on the uh, puberty. For Jane Fonda, my my voice would break. <laughs> I'd go straight back into puberty for Jane Fonda. <laughs> <laughs> Saw Barbarella, did you? A life shattering experience to me. I remember the. I remember a friend of mine's dad took me to take that, and I've never been able to thank him enough for that. Right. When I was twelve years old, see Barbarella. Um, when yeah, I was twelve, my dad took me to see Porky's. I've never stopped thanking him for that. <laughs> so, I mean, I get it in a sense. I get it. Um, sorry, you were about to say. No, it, I mean, you know, sadly, I can go on forever but you know i also know there's dwindling returns on some of these stories so not at all it's great it's been great talking to you about your experience working with kubrick and robert redford and of course arthur miller what was it like to edit the crucible <laughs> and death of a salesman um, oh sorry i mean frank Mil i mean uh steven steve miller band i mean uh right george yeah well we flew like an eagle um you know, <laughs> I'm such a dope. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, hopefully you guys are the last time I ever have to tell the stories. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can wring any more out of that towel. But thanks, man. It's been great. This, really yeah. enjoyed it. Thanks, like, really. Nice meeting you both. You I'm too, Jim. man. Let thanks me know so if you're much, ever Jay. coming back to New York, okay? Let me know if yeah. you're heading back this way. We'll get a, uh, a red solo cup of warm beer. Okay, great. All right. Later, Take man. Care. You too. Bye. Thanks, Jay. Bye. That was a really cool film chat with film editor Jay Friedkin. We can't thank him enough for sharing his stories and his time with us. 
So we're going to ask you to check out our two Facebook groups, of course, the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society and Kubrick's Universe. Also, we have two great YouTube channels, again, for SCAS and now for Kubrick's Universe. Now, we have an appeal to make to you, our loyal listeners. We've been producing this podcast for five years now, completely independently, and are very happy with the way it's going. However, every show we produce takes a lot of time out of our already busy lives with our careers and families, etc. Also, every episode does cost us money to produce. Suffice it to say, it's been a labor of love and a passion project. We ain't complaining. So, after five years working on this show, we hope you love as much as we do, and doing it all out of pocket, we've looked at the ledgers and discovered that we need to earn at least our costs back to keep bringing you this show. So, we're asking for your support to continue producing Kubrick's Universe. And remember, Kubrick's Universe is the world's only continuously running podcast devoted solely to Stanley Kubrick, the artist, the visionary, and the man. With your support, we will be able to keep bringing new content, in-depth interviews, premieres and exclusives, and the treasure trove of stories that never seem to stop pouring out of Kubrick's universe. So to that end, we've set up a Patreon page. Please go to patreon.com, search for Kubrick's universe, and support us. It's that simple. We do offer five levels of support, starting at just one English pound or one US doll hair per month. That's less than the price of one order of french fries and ketchup every month. We also have higher levels of contribution that offer extra perks. Go check it out. Now, with your gracious support in mind, we'll leave you with this. Coming soon, future attractions. The Shining with Lee Unkrich. Full Metal Jacket's Rafter Man himself, Kevin Major Howard. More from Malcolm McDowell, Leon Vitale. Vincent Labruto, Gerald Freed, Mike Kaplan, James B. Harris, and a whole host of special guests who worked on Kubrick films including The Shining, Full Metal Jacket, and Eyes Wide Shut. Which are three films that we haven't really dunked too hard on yet, but we've got it in the bag. We'll also be covering the new book, Burgess, Kubrick, and A Clockwork Orange with Matt Melia and Georgina Orgill. And we will speak to many of the other contributors. So please, help us keep this show ad-free and independent. There is a Patreon link in the show notes, or just head over to Patreon. That's... P-A-T-R-E-O-N Help us keep the show ad free and independent. <laughs> There's a Patreon link in the show notes. I just head over to Patreon and the Snowcat. Sorry. And search Kubrick's Universe. Until next time, and on behalf of Stephen Rigg, I'm your host and humble narrator, Jason Furlong, saying thanks for listening, and in the immortal words of Bartles and James, thank you for your support. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. These guys aren't scientists. They're making it up as they go along. Thank you for listening to the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Come back soon. It was real nice talking to you. Bye. Over and out. This show comes to you from the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society. Mm-hmm.